introduce myself. I, I'm Jonathan Schwab. I'm one of the pediatricians. And we have, for many years, almost a decade now, I think, we've been having periodic workshops for parents uh, to help, uh, help parents understand issues that have been coming up in our practice and in their families and difficulties or interesting things about their children's problems that we can explore together in, in a situation in a space which um, is, is different than the exam room. And today, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce two people who I work with every day, uh, Anjali Mataki and Adam Blackburn. And I'll let them tell you about who they are and what they do because it's a, they're a very integral part of what we do here at NAP. Um, I just wanna introduce this topic, which is an incredibly important topic. Um, we all know that COVID, we're in the middle of a pandemic of COVID and there are so many different things we can talk about in regards to this pandemic. One of the things I can say as a pediatrician is that in many ways, children have been spared in the sense that the illness itself, the virus itself infecting children, while even with the Delta variant is, has affected more children than it was before, the severity of illness has not been as severe as it has been in many of the older people. And that's a real blessing. The problem really with the pandemic in children have been all the other consequences that have resulted. And those consequences were what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, the anxiety and depression and stress that is this pandemic has, has caused children and families in general has been tremendous. And every day I'm being asked questions by parents about how to help their kids deal with these kinds of problems. So I'm happy to introduce Anjali and Adam and see how what we can do to help our children through this pandemic. Thanks, Adam and Anjali. And let me just say one more thing to Chris. Chris and, and Nina, um, we we liked we are recording this. I hope that's okay with you. We welcome questions. Maybe at the end they'll have. There's a presentation, and Adam and Anjali will will uh, tell you about that. And then we welcome questions at the end, and we're happy to turn the recording off at that point. Thank you for joining us. Um, hi, I'm Adam Blackburn. I'm um, licensed uh, marriage family therapist, essentially means a licensed therapist in the state of Massachusetts. I've been with uh, NAP since um, last, uh, I think last November, but you know, we lose track of time in this pandemic. So, um, and um, we uh, I were part of a team at NAP called IBH, which stands for Integrated Behavioral Health. So we're here to support families with uh, mental health and behavioral health concerns. Uh, we work in conjunction with um, the pediatricians and the medical staff. And so, um, yeah, I think I'm happy to be here. And I'm Anjali Mataki and I'm a licensed mental health clinician. I've been at NAP since about February. Um, so I'm a little, little newer to the um, practice. But um, again, like Adam said, we are an integral part of NAP and we are here to help support families in terms of, you know, mental health and stress and, you know, just kind of um, just natural things that come up as, you know, your children grow up and I'm happy to be here too. Thank you. So today we're talking about coping with COVID and the impact of uh, COVID has had on the pandemic life and um, has had on, on our mental health and the children, uh, mental health of our children specifically. Um, and so first what we're seeing, um, and uh, so we're seeing rises in anxiety and depression, uh, regression in some social skills and connection with peers um, in great part to remote learning for almost a year and a half and regression in performance at school. Uh, more school refusal or uh, difficulty with the coming back to school specifically uh, that most kids have experienced this fall. Um, also rises in reports of uh, abuse and suicidal ideation, self-harm. And of course, um, the, what we're hearing so much is uh, about the strain mental health services, how hard it is to find mental health 
support and treatment through through therapy and the like. So um, so we're going to talk about that specifically focusing on anxiety and depression. And Anjali is going to start uh, with anxiety. Um, so, you know, anxiety, there's different uh, forms of it, but in general, I have the DSM-5, uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorder definition of generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so it's basically, you know, a lot of these symptoms, which include excessive worry about events, activities that are difficult to control, um, feeling restless, fidgety, can't sit still, easily fatigued, difficulty concentrating or reporting that like your mind's going blank or black, irritability, muscle tension, and sleep disturbances. And for children, um, only one symptom is actually required to meet the criteria for generalized anxiety disorder. Um, this side doesn't, didn't include, you know, things like phobias or, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, which also are under the anxiety umbrella category, but I thought it would just be simpler to kind of focus on generalized anxiety today. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to talk about now in a very simplistic way, how anxiety is caused um, through two pathways in the brain. So one is called the cortex-based anxiety, which is actually initiated by the cortex. And then amygdala-based anxiety, which is then um, triggered by the amygdala in the brain. So on your right, you can kind of see a, um, you know, a, a visual of this and how, um, oh, can you go back one, sorry. Um, you can see how sensory information, which is things that we can see, hear, feel, taste, touch, uh, goes through the thalamus, which is kind of like Grand Central Station. It basically interprets all that sensory information, processes it, and decides what to do with it. Um, so either, you know, um, it's processing to the cortex or the amygdala. Next slide, please. Cortex-based anxiety. So again, this um, this is when the thalamus, again, the, that Grand Central Station organ uh, sends all that information to the cortex first. Um, and then it is processed through the amygdala and then creates an anxiety response. The cortex is a little bit slower to interpret this information. Um, so it takes some time. An example of cortex-based anxiety would be if you're driving along the you know, street and you see a car driving towards you, coming at you from the other direction you can, your cortex interprets the make and model of the car, and then it can determine if you should turn out of the way or break. But it's a much slower pathway, so you have time to kind of interpret what's what you're seeing um, and determine what to do at that point. Next slide, please. Amygdala-based anxiety is a little bit more visceral and it's very fast and immediate. So the thalamus, again, the Grand Central Station part of the brain sends that sensory information directly to the amygdala and creates that anxiety response. So an example of this would be if you're driving again and all of a sudden a deer darts in front of you, your amygdala is going to detect that there's some kind of threat and alert you to either brake hard or turn the wheel and you'll have that rush of adrenaline, which is presented as like increased heart rate, you might be breathing heavier, you might feel like really restless and fidgety, like your muscles are kind of on edge. Um, this all happens even before you can think about it um, and actually see what you're avoiding. So you might not even, your brain or your eyes don't even process, you know, that it's actually a deer and I need to turn out of the way or break. Your, your brain just kind of interprets that fast um, to protect you. So it's a very adaptive process. Um, but it is very fast, unlike the cortex. It's very visceral. It just makes decisions within seconds. Uh, next slide, please. There is a relationship between the cortex and amygdala. So as that previous slide indicated, you know, the amygdala does still, in the end, create that anxiety response, even though it might go through the cortex first. Um, and we can shut off our cortex sometimes when necessary. So an example would be is if you have a fear of going in the dark basement, um, but you must go down there to get something. 
you might see a dark shape that looks threatening at first when you go down there. That again, that sensory information that you see with your eyes is taken into the thalamus, then sent to the amygdala, which activates your anxiety reaction. You might jump back, you might scream, your heart races, and your adrenaline's pumping. But at the same time, the thalamus sends it also to the cortex, and the cortex determines that the shape is actually just your dad's jacket, and then tries to shut down the amygdala to say there's no threat, that it's just a, a jacket. Um, but you'll still feel those physical sensations, even though the cortex see, like interprets that there's actually no danger. Um, in the scenario, the amygdala has already been activated and created anxiety before your cortex has even time to realize that your dad's, uh, your ja the jacket is actually um, present and not something that's actually threatening or fearful. Next slide, please. So those are kind of two explanations of how, uh, two pathways, I'm sorry, that anxiety is created. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about what we focus, uh, focus in treating anxiety. Um, so a lot of times um, we see families where their child is kind of struggling with anxiety and we really like to treat the family system versus the individual child. This is important because we have seen and research shows that anxiety is uh, modeled in families. It kind of circulates through generations. And so, you know, we are treating the, you know, sibling, the maybe the parent, caregiver, um, whoever has the most interaction with the child as, as in addition to the child. So talking about, you know, how do we manage anxiety and tolerate anxiety um, as a family and how do we model it for our children? Um, it's really important to note that as a caregiver of a child, um, it's really important that you, you have um, control and kind of mediation over your own anxiety as it can really impact your child if you feel like you're not managing it yourself because um, the child interprets that, it's modeled for them, they pick up on that anxiety energy um, and they're gonna have that same kind of difficulty as they get older. Another way we treat anxiety is called mindfulness, which is basically uh, a way to stay present in the moment and what's going on here and now. So with anxiety, you tend to focus on things that have already happened or something that might happen in the future. So mindfulness skills or techniques that we teach families and children to use help us stay present of what we can control right now here, right now in this moment, instead of focusing on the things that are out of our control that may have already happened or might happen in the future. Another way we treat anxiety is the importance of self-care. So taking care of ourselves and our self-talk. So self-talk is basically our way of we talk to each ourselves and our minds and we all do it. Um, so it's basically telling ourselves, is this something that we have to fear? Is this something that we're, we're gonna be able to handle even though it's difficult? So making sure that the way you're talking to yourself or your child's kind of talking to themselves in their mind is, less anxiety provoking, but more and more realistic. Self-care, again, is, um, you know, finding a balance between your responsibilities and personal life. And for your children, you know, it would be school, their, you know, um, social responsibilities, activities outside of school, and then just kind of their family life. So finding a balance so that you are able to take breaks from the stress um, and challenges of the day. Another way we treat anxiety is focusing on supporting transitions. So transitions, you know, in the mornings to, it, to school, getting on the bus or carpooling to school, trying to navigate, you know, the challenges of adjusting from home in the morning to school. And then in the evening, you know, from home, I'm sorry, it's from school to home or to an extracurricular activity. And realizing that like transitions, you know, are going to occur during the day throughout our lives, um, but supporting our children that they're, they're resilient and they can kind of handle those challenges, even if it might be difficult and, and give them anxiety. Um, it's also important to note that if your child is struggling with anxiety, we want to validate that it is difficult. Um, so we're validating that the anxiety is real 
it's, it's, it's difficult to manage, but that they are resilient and they can overcome it. And just in, in kind of envisioning or sorry, um, kind of like communicating with them that they are not alone in kind of um, navigating it. So they have supports and naming who their supports are and the thing, the times that maybe they have overcome difficulties in the past and they can use that strength from those times to impact, you know, their difficulty that they're having now. And lastly, um, we don't want to fish for problems as we will find them. So this means if like, for example, if your child is saying, you know, they were really worried about a math test today, you don't want to ask them at the end of the day, how difficult was your math test? You're you want to kind of reframe and say, you know, I was really, I know you were really worried about your math test this morning. How did it go? And allow them to kind of label how that experience was for them. If we are kind of labeling the experience for them as difficult or anxiety provoking or awful, or, you know, uh, something that they can't overcome, um, you're, you're going to find those issues to kind of focus on. And they may not even be issues that really necessarily need a lot of addressing, it's just kind of normal kind of stress that goes throughout the day. Uh, next slide, please. And now I'll t uh, have Adam um, focus on depression. Um, so um, depression is um, major. Uh, so we're when we're talking about these these um, diagnoses, we're talking about a range um, uh, in, in severity, and obviously these are just um, this is just diagnostic criteria and everyone is unique and has their own unique experience and their own unique approach to things. So just to keep that in mind, but depression is common serious medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think and how you act. It causes feelings of sadness or a loss of interest in activities that, that you once enjoyed. It can also lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems and de decrease your ability to function. Some symptoms include feeling sad, loss of interest, as we mentioned, changes in appetite, weight loss or gain, and la lack of appetite, that the, just not having the energy to eat or feeling like needing to eat uh, for comfort, uh, trouble sleeping, sleeping too much, sleeping a lot and feeling tired, um, a loss of energy, increased fatigue, uh, feeling lethargic, um, increase in purpose, uh, purposelessness, physical, in terms of physical activity, just um, either the inability to, to stand still, feeling restless, uh, slowed movements or speech. Um, these actions um, are severe enough to be seen by others. So you actually can physically present differently um, with these symptoms. Feeling worthless, guilty, difficulty thinking, concentrating, making decisions, and of course, most troubling is the uh, thoughts of death or, or suicidal thoughts. Depression in children, not, not too different, but um, behavioral problems at school, changes in eating, sleeping habits, feeling hopeless, sad, lack of energy, uh, lack of interest in fun activities, low energy levels, general tiredness, mood changes. Uh, and most commonly uh, misconceived is irritability. So, um, you know, Depression in various forms can make people more angry and more um, just easily upset uh, by situations that normally wouldn't. And so um, a common misconception is that, you know, when, when kids are, are being angry, it it's sometimes increases conflict. So it's, it's good to sort of be aware of, of what, what's, what's causing this change in mood and, and be curious about it. Risk factors, depression can affect anyone, even a person who appears to live in relatively ideal circumstances. So um, it, it, it's not always about something necessarily, um, but the factors include biochemistry, and differences in chemicals in the brain, genetics it can run in families. If one identical twin has depression, the other has a 70% chance of having the illness at some time in life personality, people with low self-esteem or uh, who have experienced um, severe trauma repeatedly, 
um, complex trauma, um, and then environmental factors. Again, uh, continued exposure to violence, neglect, abuse, poverty makes some people more vulnerable to depression. So um, at NAP and, and IBH, we tend to manage uh, dysthymia, which is a more mild form of depression or um, mild, moderate depression on sort of the scale to, to major depression, which is when uh, someone is really incapacitated by it and needs a high level of intervention. Um, we also uh, do manage uh, suicide, suicidality and risk, uh, and, and, and we'll talk more about that when we talk about treatment. Um, but um, when, when it comes to suicidality, um, it's really important to ask questions and talk about it openly. Um, many parents feel like if they bring it up that it's gonna cause, cause the thought, but the thought's already there if it's there. Um, you, you can't put the idea in their head necessarily. It's a myth about, um, and so uh, it's healthier to just talk about it and to avoid the shame because there's uh, most people, we, we tend to, to not know how to, how to deal with that. It's, it's really scary to hear, um, but it's better to talk about it and bring it out and have a conversation about how we manage it. And certainly that's how um, mental health therapists and IBH in particular can, can help the family develop a, a, a safety plan. Uh, cutting and self-harm, uh, it's an unhealthy coping method. Um, and so, but it is a coping method that can be developed sometimes. Um, it's important to be identified and talked about. Um, sometimes people believe that uh, this means the child wants to kill themselves or die, but uh, sometimes cutting or often cutting or self-harm can be uh, a way that someone in having severe depression can access feelings um, and access a sensation. There's sometimes a feeling of hopelessness or emptiness um, or apathy. And so, that's, that's one reason that it can develop. Um, it is a risk for suicidal thoughts, not always, but obviously it's something to be taken very seriously. And uh, to, again, talk about as a family and develop uh, coping methods and, and take away the shame so that um, a child uh, or, a t or a teen that, that, that may be engaging in self-harm feels like they can talk about it with someone who can help them manage the intense feelings and think of ways to get through it in a more healthy manner. So uh, just some uh, resources for people in case you don't have them. Um, there's um, obviously crisis services in this county uh, in the different counties. Um, there's a suicide prevention line and then the crisis text line uh, is, is um, specifically for teens and run by teens. So um, that, that can be a good option sometimes. Um, it's in, in opening the conversation between yourself and your, your child with about suicidality and self-harm, you know, sometimes they may not want to talk with you. So part of the conversation that, uh, that you can develop around this is, okay, you don't have to tell me the details, but I need to know if you're not feeling safe. I need to know that if you feel like you're in danger and if, if it would help for you to, to call someone or text someone uh, from one of these lines to, to talk with them, then you know I'm gonna support you and I'm not gonna ask you questions, but I'm just gonna make sure that, that I know that you're safe. So you develop a way to, to communicate with, with your child to, to, to be reassured. Um, a lot of a lot of teens specifically, because it's developmentally appropriate, don't want to share things with their parents. And uh, they actually, some of them don't want to do that at all. So, so it runs counteractive to, to, to what, where they would be normally developmentally sometimes. So, so the, a, a way of developing a conversation about um, you feeling safe as a parent and them feeling like you're not going to uh, be around them all the time and kind of invading their privacy, which would make their symptoms worse in some cases. So, so treatment, um, it's treatment similar to, um, to anxiety. Um, and often there is an overlapping symptom 
uh, mixing between depression and anxiety. Um, so some examples, um, opposite action is a DBT skill, and we'll be talking in treatment um, about DBT groups. DBT stands for Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and it's similar to Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, if you've heard of that, um, but it incorporates more um, activities around um, self-care and avoiding uh, self-harm, uh, and also mindfulness. The concept of mindfulness is, is integrated into the work of DBT. Opposite action is a skill uh, that is very effective with depression, um, which is you know, when someone's out of the, the more severe uh, parts of dep uh, major depression, um, then really hel helping to, you know, the coming out of that will sometimes, uh, Anjali talked about self-talk, um, people don't believe that they can get better and, and, and it can all, uh, kind of alter your mind in a more pessimistic way. So sort of doing the opposite of that. Is, is the idea, doing the opposite of what you might incline, be inclined to do. Uh, challenging negative self-talk and the distorted thinking process, as I was mentioning before. Mindfulness, um, like Anjali uh, spoke about before. And of course, medication management, which we do not provide. Um, that's provided by the pediatricians or a psychiatrist, uh, but all, often the most effective way to address depression is a combination of medication and treatment at the same time. Um, so now we're gonna kind of focus on what we do at um, IBH, so Integrated Behavioral Health at NAP. So we provide short-term consultation work for families. So anyone that's referred to us um, by the pediatrician, we will, um, you know, meet with the parent um, for kids like 10 and under. We usually do a parent consult first just to determine really what's going on, how we can be most helpful to the parent and family or child and make some recommendations. Um, other, you know, cases we will provide more, more sessions. So approximately we would offer six sessions at the most, but again, this fluctuates depending on the needs of the family and the child. Um, and it's really, you know, that first kind of consultation that we do with the family really determines uh, how many sessions we would provide. Um, so again, the parent consultation we do normally for children 10 and younger. Um, and then, uh, you know, at that point, we might decide to meet with your child. We might make recommendations for other resources and services in the community, um, or just sometimes have ongoing just parent consults, depending on how old the child is or their willingness to engage in the therapeutic process. Um, we also provide short-term family therapy. So, um, you know, base, basically, you know, working on communication. Um, if there's you know, risk involved, like we talked about earlier, any risk for self-harm or suicidal thoughts. Obviously, that is something we have to address as a family. So we would work with everyone to kind of make sure that the, the um, child is safe and has adequate resources to access in this time. And then lastly, we, we help navigate finding other services in the community. So again, our work is short term, and it's it's sometimes infrequent. So we can't guarantee that we'll meet with someone every week. It really is up to our clinical judgment. Um, but other services that are in, the, are in the community can meet with families maybe once a week or even twice a week to help foster, um, you know, like kind of just strength building a little bit faster than we can provide. So we often, you know, help families find those services and get connected um, by making referral recommendations, et cetera. So um, different modalities of the treatment. I, I mentioned CBT and DBT, um, and uh, we do play therapy. We have uh, rooms with, with toys in them. Uh, often play therapy is, is a way that, um, that children communicate through play. So um, they're not gonna come in as we know and sit down on the couch and start talking. Um, we develop rapport with them. We make them feel safe and comfortable and toys, games, art, all these different uh, ways of engaging help, help them 
open up and be able to talk about what's going on. Uh, for specific kinds of anxiety, specifically a needle phobia or um, op um, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, exposure response therapy is, is about helping them build a tolerance for the thing that scares them and also developing self-talk around how they can understand and, and um, manage their fears and get support in order to do that. Some forms of, of these, however, may need more intensive and frequent treatment than we can provide. And so, like Anjali mentioned, we may recommend uh, a specialist or, or a therapist or, and help you find one out in the community the best we can to, uh, to manage these. Uh, specifically with OCD, it really needs uh, weekly check-ins because you're getting skills, you're practicing exposing yourself in various ways. And, um, and the, sometimes we will do needle phobia in short-term work, uh, but it will also involve you know, meeting once or twice a week. I'm gonna jump down to the bottom. We have a, one uh, IBH provider, um, Desiree, who's not here today, but she is trained in EMDR, um, which, uh, uh oh, I forgot what it stands for. We talked about this before, but it has to do with rapid eye movement and um, and sort of it's, it's not hip, hypnotherapy, but it's along the same lines of that to um, really um, access more more of uh, someone's control over or feeling control over their body, uh, which in various forms of trauma, and you know sometimes needle phobia is is from uh, really mild trauma, um, and and this kind of goes back to the science that Anjali was talking about. the 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 physical part of our body may react before the intellectual part, and and that causes it, it makes it difficult to just. Kind of re reason our way through these things that we're really scared of and so we can provide that uh, in certain cases also we offer supportive psychotherapy and, and family therapy as we mentioned before um, again these tend to be short term and we uh, work with you and uh, sometimes the pediatrician to really figure out the best approach and the, the best what what your family needs most When we do re recommend uh, more intensive work, um, that's uh, for a variety of reasons, um, but uh, we kind of think of, of uh, different levels of care, they're called. So um, from less intensive to more intensive. So for example, the most intensive is probably being uh, in the hospital and uh, that tends to be short term and then a step down from that would be uh, what's called partial hospitalization or CBAT. Partial hospitalization is actually an outpatient kind of treatment, but it's more intensive. So uh, if you started in partial hospitalization, you would probably be attending for a week or two every day doing intensive group work. Um, CBAT is um, when um, you are actually living in, in the treatment facility um, and getting treatment in, in, in that way. Um, also, there's DBT or, and other educational groups or support groups or um, what we call psychoeducational groups where you learn skills uh, in a group setting. This can be really effective with uh, anxiety or, and specifically depression because a lot of people suffering from depression feel like it's just happening to them. They feel very isolated. And to be able to join with peers and realize that you're not alone and that there is some commonality to the experience is really beneficial and then applying the skills and practicing them and feeling safe enough to talk about that. And then community therapists. So this is sort of the like weekly therapy or bi-weekly therapy, depending on what you and, and the therapists agree on. Um, typically, we recommend uh, looking for either there are agencies, there are multiple agencies that we refer to, and then there are private practice therapists. Um, and there's pros and cons to both. Uh, the pros about the agencies is they tend to have a big big staff and uh, the waiting lists tend to be shorter uh, because um, therapists working in private practice tend to hold on to their patients for, or uh, clients for, um, for a long time. And you don't know, they don't always have openings or they may, um, not respond. 
to calls because they're they have a full uh, client load. The agencies will sort of be more on top of that. They'll have an intake department that will first interview you and um, and interview your child. Um, but the downside to the agencies is there tends to be um, more, uh, more coming and going of of, of staff. Um, and so um, sometimes people feel like they they may see multiple therapists and that may be hard for, for some people to adjust to. So um, there's pros and cons of both sides. Um, so now we're gonna focus on how this all applies to our main topic for today, which is, you know, getting through these times, quote unquote, COVID times. Um, so we have a couple of tips generally that um, we're gonna go over. Um, and so one of them is, you know, making sure that your family, however you, you identify as a family, you are doing things that brings you together or bonds you together. So whatever your family identifies as bonding time. So it can be physical exercise, like hiking or walking. Um, it can be meal time. So making sure that Maybe not every night, but a free, you know, a couple times a week, you have meals together, whether it's lunch or dinner. Um, and then just checking in with your children a little bit more. So even though, you know, teenagers have a tendency to not want to talk to their parents and want that space and rather be talking to their friends online, you know, especially right now, you know, checking in with them a little bit more frequently about how they're doing, or even just um, a lot like asking them about something that, you know, maybe they read recently and you can kind of just talk about, it doesn't specifically have to be about mental health. It just kind of creates this open door of communication between you and your child. Um, so that if there's something they want to talk about, that's a little bit more serious, they feel like they can, and they feel comfortable to do so. Yeah. So, and, and there's an acronym, uh, HALT, which is hungry, angry, lonely, tired. So I think that applies a lot um, in sort of checking them with and teaching your children self-care, ensuring they're getting the right sleep and they're eating healthy snacks and and doing the best to to promote wellness in that respect. Um, also, screen time is something we hear a lot about, and I think a lot of families had to adjust to having more screen time in their lives with. Um, things being remote, because that was one way that kids and teens could connect with each other. And so making an intentional screen time pause uh, and making it family-wide so that that we as parent, you as parents uh, can also put down our phones or devices and have an intentional time to either connect or not be online, not be in front of a screen. Also, it's really important to be mindful of screen time before bed because it can really affect the sleep cycle. Um, oh, you want me to? I can go, sorry. <laughs> um, another thing that is really helpful is gratitude or mindfulness strategies. So again, the, the concept of mindfulness is really being present in the moment and sometimes being finding things that we're grateful for today um, that are happening right now. Um, so one technique that I usually can recommend to people is called the GLAD technique, G-L-A-D. So G stands for gratitude, um, L is for leisure, A is for accomplishments, and then D is delight. So um, things that you're grateful for, L is, um, you know, for leisure things that, you know, you can do that decrease stress. A is looking for even small accomplishments in your day. So, you know, it doesn't have to be very big, like um, running a marathon, but it can be just more of, I was able to make my bed today and I haven't done it in like weeks. Uh, D is delight. So anything that made you laugh, um, you know, made you smile. It could be a joke that someone told. Um, and so you can definitely Google this strategy. It's online, um, G-L-A-D. And, you know, just start practicing it for, you know, I, I think they recommend like every day for a number of weeks and see how much of a difference you're focusing more on 
things that you want to be mindful and grateful for rather than the stress, the negativity. It kind of keeps your focus and shifts your focus to more positive things throughout the day. And, and be sure, you know, with, with all the anxiety um, that, that kids may have, uh, some of it about COVID, um, be aware of where they're getting their uh, information from and help them find the facts and the actual science, the science behind the information. And you have a great resource in, in Jonathan Schwab. He's, he's, he, he has a lot of information about what's going on with COVID and, and the pediatricians are a great resource uh, for just answering some questions. Um, there's sometimes a lot of questions and misconceptions about COVID. And so be sure that they're not going to TikTok for, for their COVID information. Um, also focus on the here and now. So, you know, that's sort of a mindfulness uh, concept, you know, uh, and meaning, what, what's likely to occur with, you know, what are the things that they may be worried about that are likely to occur that, that may, be, may warrant some talking and preparation versus what might happen. And anxiety really sometimes propels us to, to forecast into the future and worry about uh, things that haven't happened yet. And that amplifies our anxiety even more. And then, we're all of a sudden in a, in a situation that has nothing to do with where we are at the moment. Um, and be honest if you don't know something. Um, it's okay to, to not know and use resources like I was saying, like the pediatricians at NAP. Um, as uh, Anjali was saying before, don't always assume that um, you know what your child's concern is or create it from your own concern, but you know, be curious, ask them questions, see what, what they're worried about or not and uh, what their thoughts are. We don't have to know everything. And then lastly, it's really important as caregivers to take care of yourself. And this goes back to, um, you know, when we're on airplanes and how they say, you know, you should put your oxygen mask on first before you help your child or someone else next to you. So this is really important that you are addressing any stressors, things that make life difficult um, for yourself and because you're, you're only going to be as great as, or your child's only gonna be doing as well as you're doing. So it's really important that you are taking steps to, you know, do some of these mindfulness, gratefulness practices. Um, you know, if you need to find a therapist for yourself, you know, making sure that's a priority, taking breaks um, and creating boundaries for yourself. So not feeling like you have to, you know, uh, achieve everything in one day or take on so much that's not possible and realistic. That's it. <laughs> well, thank you very much for a wonderful overview of, of what's happening uh, to many of the children in our community in relationship to how COVID has resulted in anxiety and depression. Um, I, what we, we were planning on, we're very, uh, we're a small group today, um, so I, we'd like to open it up if, if, if our participants, other participants here would like to ask any questions about uh, what we are talking about today, uh, get some clarifications about um, what, what we do here at NAP and, and what our IBH team does or anything <laughs> for that matter, uh, please feel free. There's a small group we can even, if you would rather chat and ask.